I had a nice Japanese Imperial Navy ship's clock sent to me the other day. All Japanese military timepieces I have seen carry the marks of Sikosha and Hatterai. Very few can be found from this manufacturer. This is a Atikai Tokiai Denki. My Japanese is not too good. In English it translates to Achi Clock Electric KK. It's a rare military piece in exceptional shape for its age. The back of the case has some recent scratches. Some type of greenish colored corrosion here, or maybe some residue left from a label. On the leading edge you can see a solder joint. It's where the back and the side of the case are joined. Very nice job done on this joint. Barely visible to the untrained eye. Up here on top it's a little more visible. This top mounting bracket is brass. It's fastened to the back with the steel rivet. This screw is a secondary fastener. The shiny steel here is a sign that someone slipped in the slot with a screwdriver recently. Some exposed solder from the edge joint. Blackish patina on the back is oxidized silver. Lower mounting bracket. Steel rivet. The screw head has some bright steel showing, so someone has had a screwdriver on this recently as well. The other lower mounting bracket steel rivet and screw holding it in place. Sides of the case have several dents. This screw holds the front frame in place. A fairly deep dent here. The case has a thick protective wax finish on it. Feels like a beeswax based product. Good protection from the elements. Small dent and scratch here. Fairly large dent here showing some oxidized brass the solder joint where the two ends of the side were soldered together. Up close you can see the solder joint better. Lots of deep pitting in the brass the buffing wheel couldn't reach. They show up as dark oxidized pits. Another fastener screw for the front frame. Very nice shape for its age. The side of the case was silvered when new. These two fasteners are rivets holding the bezel latch assembly in place. The bezel latch knob, it's spring loaded and works quite smoothly. Several deep scratches here. The front of the frame shows signs of silvering that didn't get removed when it was buffed. The hinge is brass. Originally it was nickel plated. These two symbols is a name of a person. Second symbol refers to someone named Zoe. 
The next two symbols refers to a sailing or ocean going vessel. The trademark of the clock manufacturer, I'm not going to try to pronounce it. Not sure of the meaning of this symbol. Could be the name of the ship it was commissioned to. This anchor is the Imperial Japanese Navy symbol. This is the serial identification number of the clock, used for its servicing and history records. The Imperial Japanese Navy was created in 1868 and dissolved in 1945. I believe this clock is from what is called the Menji era of Japanese history, 1868 to 1912. Remove the fastener screws for the front. They aren't original as you can see. The screw threads are rounded, appear to have incorrect threads on them. There are different lengths and head styles as well. The glass looks original and has a bevel on it. The bezel to glass fit up is excellent. Some excess adhesive in places. It looks like a rubber silicone product, so it's not the original mounting adhesive here. This is some type of clear hard product on top of the surface of the buffed brass. It was put here sometime after it was buffed. Could be Elmer's glue or lacquer. Some type of clear finish here on top of the polished brass. The dial is in a distressed condition. Extra thick dial washer, no doubt original. Someone has modified it, filing a clearance notch in it. This second washer is probably the reason the clearance notch was filed in the original washer. It's got an elongated hole in it. Minute hand is original and it has an elongated locating hole in it. Our hand is the same style as the minute hand. Nice original set of hands here. The seconds hand has a nice heavy brass split tube on it. To remove the front assembly, I'll use a piece of oak. I'll use the mounting brackets on the back to pry against. The oak wood never leaves tool marks and scratches like screwdrivers or metal tools will. back of the dial looks like it has the original silvering on it. The hinge looks like it's nickel plated, has some steel mounting screws in it. They don't appear to be original. They don't nest in the countersink fully. Original screws probably would have been nickel plated brass and with a better fit up than these. This black's oxidation is silver, so the front was originally silvered. The front frame is made from a cast brass. Mounting screw hole, 
A few scratches from someone using maybe a screwdriver to remove it sometime in the past. These sides of the front frame have tooling marks from when it was machined on a lathe. Signs of silvering here where the buffer wheel couldn't reach. Looking for markings or dates, but don't see any yet. Lots of intact silvering here. Winding keyhole is dented from the key being used in it, but not bad. The hole for the center arbor is in real good shape. The second hand hole has been modified. The brass is burred and curled over here. Raw brass is exposed and shiny. This is a recent modification. Several fingerprints here and there. Four screws holding the dial to the front frame. The inner bezel ring is nickel plated, same as the hinges. Surface of the dial has some heavy pitting in it. This looks like some type of adhesive. It feels rock hard, not sure what it is. The black lacquer in the numbers is in fair condition, could use some touch up. There aren't many of these clocks around. Made by, and I'm not going to try to pronounce this word, KK Nagoya Japan. This is the trademark of the maker, the model number of this clock, unusual left hand winding direction for the winding key. These symbols indicate it's a one day movement or to wind once each day. So it's a one day movement. The silvering on the dial is getting thin, and oxidized brass is showing in areas. The pitting is heavy, so it would be a challenge to resilver it and have it look pristine. Better a preservation project than a restore project. From the front side, you can see tool marks on this enlarged second hand hole. There's plenty of clearance for the second hand. Not sure why this was done. Looking at this latch, it's quite simple but functional. This nut is soldered to the threaded steel shaft. And the brass knob looks like it's soldered to the steel shaft. The movement is fastened to this piece of wood that's painted black. Oh! This fastener nut is loose. It goes to those three rusty screws on the back. This one is loose too.
Movement is held in with four screws. One long mismatched screw. I spoke to the owner concerning this repair label. There's concern it may not be certified as acid-free materials. So he's asked me to remove it and save it. The back has some type of gummy adhesive on it. I've seen labels like these cause problems with old pieces in the past. No extra fastener holes on the wood, so all original here. This counterboard hole in the wood, it's a relief hole for the adjustable bushing assembly on the back of the movement. A nice gold gilt movement. Punch marks on the click rivet. Someone has adjusted it tighter sometime in the past. Two marks on this screw head. A deep depression here in the front plate. Looks like it's been there since it was new. The maker's trademark. Usually there would be a washer here to prevent the hour wheel from moving too far forward. Was probably left off by a previous repair person. Not sure where this black residue came from on this pivot. A gouge in the brass plate next to the bushing. Pivot for the pallet fork. This is the balance staff thrust bearing and a mount for the regulator, and the two mounting screws. Regulator works smoothly. Rear plate. Escape wheel pivot has a bushing installed. It also has a deep gouge in the plate next to it. A little loose now. The adjustable bearing for the pallet fork. Bearing for the balance staff. It doesn't look original. There's two threaded screws on either side of the bearing. They match the same size as on the front plate. I believe it's been modified in this area. A lot of dirt particles on this movement. A 
Lubrication on the escape wheel teeth is all dried and dirty. A lot of buildup on them. Escape wheel rotates freely. Pivots seem to be in good shape. The hairspring hasn't been installed correctly. It's not going through the regulator pins. Original hairspring has been replaced with a modern one. Hope they timed it correctly to the balance wheel. Curvature of the hairspring doesn't follow the regulator pins. Not good. The owner says it won't stay running. It keeps stopping. The balance wheel is sticking or jamming up right now. Very poor motion on the balance wheel. Before I move forward, I'll need to see if I can at least get it to run. First I'll set the hairspring in the regulator pins where it belongs. This hairspring taper pin doesn't have a very clean cut on the end of it. All rough and jagged, like it was broke to size instead of cut. I'll get this hairspring run through the regulator pins and see if it'll stay running better. Still only about 15 degrees of amplitude on the balance wheel. Should be up around 300 degrees. Set the regulator pins so the balance spring is sitting freely between them. Give it another go. With it at slow motion, I can see a problem with the fork as it leaves the balance impulse pin. The fork when it leaves the balance impulse pin on the top side immediately jumps in a downward motion. The fork slot is hitting the impulse pin, pushing it backwards. This is slowing down the balance motion. 
The pallet fork has a recoil motion in it. It's running about 30 seconds fast for each minute. Problem could be someplace in the escape wheel teeth or pallets. The escape wheel teeth are not contacting the locking surface of the pallets. They're just contacting the center portion of the impulse face on each pallet. I see one escape wheel tooth is twice as thin as the others. I suspect someone has modified or butchered this area in the past. This surface here is the locking surface. Each escape wheel tooth should contact the surface first. This locking surface should hold the escape wheel to a dead stop. Then slide across the angled pallet surface. The escape wheel tooth sliding across the angled pallet surface is what gives the balance wheel the amplitude motion. These teeth are hitting the impulse surface and are missing the locking surface altogether. The hairspring is vibrating between the regulator pins as it should now. Almost looks like the pallet surfaces where the escape wheel teeth contact them have been reshaped. Or the escape wheel teeth reshaped and made shorter. Not sure yet, but the escape wheel teeth fall short of striking the pallet locking surfaces. These movements are rare. 
there's a little chance to find another movement for parts, or even one to use as a comparison of parts. Looks like this one has been butchered, possibly in more than one mystery location. At this point, I'm not sure how many items have been modified on this movement by the last person working on it. I'll get with the customer and see how he wants to proceed on this movement. <laughs> 